But we must begin to understand that in a concept of forming inside our community a united front, a black united front, which engulfs every sector, every facet, and every person inside our community working for the I benefit of black people. I told her a lot of the book. I helped with it, but she wrote the book. And she is the architect and the designer of the book. Mm -hmm. All of that I give to my wife. Mm -hmm. And I want to say this, that whatever praise that comes my way for this, it belongs to my wife. Mm -hmm. She was with me every step of the way. Mm -hmm. When I was going through my problems with the United States government and fighting them tooth and nail, Nail, not given, no, not given a quarter, not asking for any quarter. Mm -hmm. She fought with me all the way through uh, Guyana, that uh, foreign country. She made herself a native Guyana, Guyanese. Uh, she just was with me all the way. And I want to say this to uh, you, young fellows. There are a couple of young fellows in here who perhaps qualify for that. Uh, uh, being called young. If you have not yet found your life mate, I would suggest you check with me afterwards and let me give you some suggestions <laughs> as to yes, sir. what direction you might look in. <laughs> and you might be, uh, you might find what you need and what you should have. Uh, those of you who have the life mate and you're satisfied, I'm saying stick with her. Right. Love her and be with her. And there's only one for you. And so when you get that one, cherish her, support her, and be with her all the way down the highway of life. Now, when I came back. Read the poem. Read the speech now. <laughs> I didn't interfere. I didn't interfere. <laughs> ignore, ignore any remarks about my wife. I didn't make, I didn't make any remarks that she was talking about. I didn't say a word. Okay? Oh, no. Okay, good. Now, when I came back, I took a deliberate decision that uh, I wanted to come back for a number of reasons. But one, I wanted to be with my grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and my children. I wanted to be a part of this uh, uh, problem that we have, we still have it here in this country. The, the battle for our liberation was still ongoing, and it seemed to be going up the wrong alley. We weren't making any progress. When I appeared in court that day, I was back in the back of the bullpen where they keep the prisoners who were going to be heard before the judge that day. And I asked my lawyer to step out and ask the judge if she would allow me to speak to the court, to her court. I had no idea what I would say at that point, but I felt that because of the large number of people who had come out to meet me, that I owed it to them to explain why I came back and where to place the blame for the problems that were confronting me and the black people in this country. So now having said that, dear wife, I shall move on gallantly and do my reading assignment. Bear with me that uh, I am not the same person I was when I left here. So I'll say that and no more, and I'll get on with the reading. I wrote this in the bullpen, and when I came out, I read it for the first time. I had no chance to read it or to practice it or whatever. So here goes. Your Honor, officers of this court, brothers, sisters, comrades, friends, and enemies, I am a political prisoner 
who has been jailed for my political beliefs and activities during the violent period of the 1960s when black people were struggling for civil rights and equality in racist America. Many of us who were involved in that struggle came under the influence and the teachings of L. Hodge, Malik L. Shabazz, Malcolm X, perhaps the greatest black man of this century. Fortunately, I was one of those persons. Your Honor, it was Brother Malcolm who exposed to us the historical reign of terror launched against Africa by the European plunderers centuries ago. This illegal and unjust act of warfare culminated in the enslavement of a nation of black people who were brought in chairs to the new world called America. It was, bear with me, please. Well, thank you, man. I wondered when somebody would come to my rescue. <laughs> it was Brother Malcolm who revealed to us the cultural, the social, the economic, the political, the psychological and the spiritual de devastation to which our ancestors were subjected during more than 250 years of barbaric slavery. It was Brother Malcolm who defined our status as 20th century colonized people. And it was Brother Malcolm who shifted the focus of the black movement from the narrow goal of civil rights to the broader and more basic goal of human rights, which America's institutionalized racism and white supremacy, civil supremacy has systematically denied us, both during and after slavery down to the present time. Because of the hostility of the United States government towards black people, and because of the United States government's refusal to extend the, the constitutional guarantees of justice and equality to us, Brother Malcolm called for unity self-determination and self-defense self -defense as prerequisites for the total liberation, liberation of our black colonized nation from the totalitarian control of the United States government. Your Honor, it is because of my firm belief in these precepts that I stand before this court today. In defiance of all evidence to the contrary, Your Honor, I thought, I, thought, I foolishly thought it was my inalienable right to freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and the right to self-defense. And I proceeded to so act, just as I observed white people do it in protection of their rights. Every act and every act and every word of mine during that period of the 60s was based on the firm belief that what I was doing and what I was saying was legally sound, and my rights to do so were embedded in American law and the tradition established by America's founding fathers based on the innate rights of an oppressed people to resist and defy tyranny and, de and de despotism. It is hard to believe that I was so naive there. The FBI records indicated that from 1963 to 1965, a period of two years, during which time I was placed under the most intense surveillance, there was no evidence that I, Herbert Ferguson, broke any law during that long period of time, or that I ever, or that I even intended to break the law. Yet, Your Honor, I was labeled in 1965 and 1963 by the FBI and the New York City Police Department as a black nationalist activist, someone to be watched closely and someone to be considered as dangerous and a threat to the national and international security of America. It was not until 1965, after two long years of waiting for me to break one of their laws, that the FBI and the police realized that this was not going to happen, infiltrated a community-based organization 
that I headed with an agent provocateur whose sole assignment was to entrap me in some illegal activity. It took the FBI and the FBI, it took the FBI and the police and their undercover Negro agents two more years of screaming, scheming and plotting before they were able to concoct and involve me in a spurious plot to assassinate civil rights leaders. Your auditor, from, time, from the time of my arrest in 1967 until this day, I am Your Honor, from the time of my arrest in 1967 until this day, I have steadfastly maintained my innocence of those charges, and I shall continue to do so as long as there is breath in my body. After the rejection of my appeals in 1970, and justifiably fearing for my safety, and convinced I could not obtain justice in the United States of America at that time, due to the climate of fear and hatred towards black people that was fomented by the FBI and exacerbated by the news media. I did not su surrender, but instead I understandably fled the country and went into political exile. Your Honor, many people have asked since my voluntary return to this country on April 6, 1989, why did you come back? To me, the answer is simple. I came back because this is where I belong, with my people, helping in the struggle to destroy the evil racism that has denied us justice, freedom, and equality for 370 years. Certainly, I wanted to see my family, whom I had not seen for almost 20 years. Certainly, I wanted to clear my name of these false charges. Your Honor, a man would be less than human not to carry such feelings in his heart and in his mind. But the overwhelming, but the overwhelming elevate, uh, motivation to return was the realization that the struggle I left behind had become such a total part of my life that I believe I would, try to, I would try to come back from the dead to make whatever contribution I could towards the successful conclusion of that struggle. 